Welcome to another workshop in the Interstate Technology and Regulatory Council's series about per and polyfluoroalkyl substances. I'm Kevin Long. I'm a principal consultant and risk assessor with TerraPhase Engineering Incorporated. The purpose of this particular video is to assist you in understanding the specific challenges associated with assessing and characterizing risk to human health and ecological receptors exposed to PFAS in the environment. I will also cover various federal and state PFAS-related regulatory actions in the United States. With this training, you'll gain a better understanding of the specific challenges we face in being able to perform site risk assessments involving PFAS exposure. But despite these challenges, we are at a point where we can use risk assessment science effectively to support PFAS risk management decision making. Finally, you'll also come away with a good understanding of the current yet evolving state of PFAS regulatory action in the United States. In covering these topics, you'll see that the current state of our knowledge is such that we can still make good use of risk assessment science to support PFAS risk management decisions to protect human health and the environment. Although there still are uncertainties and unanswered questions regarding PFAS exposure and toxicity, which can make risk assessment a challenge. You'll also see that because of the ever-changing landscape, of PFAS regulatory action and how it's tied to our knowledge of how these chemicals have evolved, it's important to keep abreast of the state of the science and consult with your local regulatory agencies, consultants, and legal counsel for guidance on how best to navigate the PFAS management challenge. Now let's talk about PFAS site risk assessment. You can think of risk assessment as a systematic and scientific characterization of potential adverse effects from exposure to hazardous agents or to hazardous chemicals. This involves considering the types of hazards that a receptor is or could be exposed to, the extent of their exposure to such hazards, and the relationship between exposure and the likelihood of an adverse effect. More simply, you can think of risk as being made up of two parts, exposure and hazard. The exposure component involves a determination for how individuals might come into contact with a dangerous agent and at what magnitude, frequency, and duration. The hazard part involves a determination of what the potential health effects might be in the event of exposure to that hazardous agent. The hazard component also involves quantifying the relationship between the amount of exposure and the health effects associated with that exposure. This is often called the dose-response relationship. Risk assessment has become a dominant and critical public policy tool for informing risk managers and the public about the different policy options that are under consideration for protecting public health and the environment. It's also been very instrumental in helping states and the federal agencies fulfill their various missions. For these reasons, risk assessment plays a, a significant role in helping federal and state authorities make and support decisions regarding protecting public health and the environment, from exposure to PFAS, including through regulatory action. The scientific characterization of risk from chemicals at a site can take one of two basic forms. This graphic presents a general overview of the site risk assessment process. It involves accounting for the environmental media uh, impacted by the chemical, the concentration to which a receptor is exposed to in that media, quantifying the exposure or the dose, accounting for the toxicity of the chemical through the dose-response relationship, and then putting all these pieces together in order to calculate a quantitative estimate of risk of an adverse effect. What's presented here is sometimes referred to as a forward risk calculation. Alternatively, risk-based chemical concentrations can be calculated for a specific exposure scenario at a target risk level by rearranging this calculation. This is sometimes referred to as a reverse risk assessment. It's the general process used by regulatory agencies to derive and support risk-based concentrations, screening levels, and standards. So for example, the drinking water health advisories derived by US EPA for PFOA and PFOS were developed using a reverse risk assessment process. It's important to be aware that there are still very specific challenges that we currently face in being able to take full advantage of risk assessment science when PFAS exposure is or could be of concern. 
With regards to exposure, these challenges could include distinguishing site-related from non-site-related impacts, limitations in our ability to sample and characterize PFAS concentrations in various media, and difficulties we have in being able to reliably model the fate and transport of some PFAS in the environment due to their unique chemistry and a general lack of physical chemical properties for these chemicals. We have a great deal of knowledge about the more commonly reported perfluoracyl acids, such as PFOS and PFOA, but we have a long way to go with the, very, uh, with the less well-known PFAS. More detail about these challenges and the limitations of each are covered in other ITRC PFAS training videos. So I'm not going to go into additional detail in this training, but would encourage you to check those out if you're interested. Similarly, with regard to the PFAS hazard, there are still limitations in our ability to assess the hazard and quantify the dose response, response relationship for several PFAS. Although a significant amount of work has been done on the more commonly reported perfluoroalkyl acids, such as PFOS and PFOA. These challenges may include a lack of toxicity values for particular PFAS or, for or, or determining what toxicity to va values to use when multiple values are available from the same, for the same compound from various reputable sources. With specific regards to ecological risk assessment, we're currently limited in the availability of ecological benchmarks. Also, the complexities associated with the large number of receptor types for which exposure and risk is to be considered can be challenging. If you're interested in learning more, additional detail about these challenges and limitations are covered in other ITRC PFAS training sessions, and in particular the training module on human and ecological effects. Depending on the methodologies and assumptions used in a particular site-specific risk assessment, the potential critical uncertainties can include estimating the future environmental concentrations due to airborne deposition, estimating the trans transformation of precursors into PFAA terminal end products, modeling groundwater transport, considering such factors as chemical-specific retardation and back diffusion, estimating bioconcentration, bioaccumulation, of PFAS in a particular animal or plant or via food chain modeling, handling missing toxicity or dose response information for some site-related PFAS for which receptors could be exposed, using toxicity values for a particular PFAS as a surrogate for another, and using information from surrogate organisms to evaluate potential risks for organisms for which toxicity studies do not exist. Each of these critical uncertainties is discussed in detail in ITRC's PFAS Technical Regulatory Guidance document, and I'd encourage you to review it should you wish to learn more. Now, despite these uncertainties, most of which are fairly common to many emerging contaminants, we can at this time conduct site risk assessments effectively to support PFAS risk management decisions. I'm gonna shift gears a little bit here now and show you an example of where a regulatory agency utilized risk assessment science to support a decision regarding the need for guidance. In this example, the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection conducted an initial assessment of PFAS impacts at a select group of surface water bodies within the state of New Jersey. Their objective was to determine the need for fish consumption advisories for PFAS in those specific water bodies. DEP identified 11 specific water bodies in the state, selected for sampling based on their location relative to the potential, uh, potential identified sources of PFAS and the likelihood that they could be used for recreational purposes. Fish tissue samples were collected for three to four species at each site and for 12 different species overall across all of these sites. And the samples were analyzed for 13 specific PFAS. The results indicated that while not all PFAS were detected, the predominant compound detected was PFOS. In the chart here, PFOS is represented by the gray bars. As you can clearly see, PFOS was by far the predominant chemical found in tissue. It's important to note, however, that this chart compiles data from the different locations, and not all species were sampled in each location. The variability in PFAS detections and concentrations may be related more to the location and the environmental con concentrations identified at that location. For more detail and discussion of the department's results, I would encourage you to review their report. 
New Jersey DEP then utilized the non-cancer toxicity values, specifically reference doses they have derived for PFOA and PFOS and PFNA for their regulatory programs. And generic assumptions regarding the amount of exposure anticipated by individuals who could potentially consume fish caught in these waters. Then accounting for different possible consumption frequencies, NGDEP used a reverse risk assessment process to calculate fish tissue concentrations for the three PFOS. These tables show the acceptable fish tissue concentrations calculated for the various consumption rates assumed. Unlimited meals, one meal per week, all the way down to a do not eat recommendation. Applying the advisory levels to the measured concentrations in fish tissue samples from each of these waterways resulted in NGDEP recommending fish consumption advisories for the general population, some of which are shown here. PFOS was the driver for many of these advisories. Even the intended control site, Echo Lake, warranted an advisory for PFOS. Please note that not all the fish-specific advisories determined by the department using the risk assessment methodology that I've described are captured here. I'm going to talk now about PFOS regulatory action in the United States. As I've just showcased, regulatory agencies are using risk assessment science to support risk management decisions, despite some challenges and limitations in our knowledge and understanding of these chemicals. As was the case with the example we just looked at, agencies have been able to use the science in a manner that can be used to support their missions and objectives. The trends in regulatory action in the United States can be lumped into four different categories. Actions to help address concerns regarding PFAS exposure via drinking water, to PFAS in products, in food and food packaging, and in other environmental media. With regards to drinking water, beginning as early as 2006, federal and state agencies have been using risk assessments science to derive risk-based guidelines for PFAS. In 2009, EPA established provisional short-term drinking water health advisories for PFOA and PFOS. In 2016, they replaced the short-term health advisories with lifetime health advisories. Now, initially, several states followed EPA's lead, and several still today utilize EPA's health advisories for decision-making purposes. However, as of November 2019, several states had derived their own risk-based values for PFOA and or PFOS, resulting in a variety of concentrations ranging from 5.1 nanograms per liter to 35 nan nanograms per liter, with New Jersey, New York, and New Hampshire proposing their values as maximum contaminant levels. As a side note, a law was signed in Vermont requiring the agency to set an MCL by 2020. Finally, several states have also been working to establish drinking water guidelines for other PFAS. The trend in how these guidelines for PFOA have emerged is illustrated here, with the lowest value being issued by California in 2018. A similar trend can be seen with PFOS values, also with, the, with California establishing the lowest value in 2018, and New Jersey, New Hampshire, New York, the, the only states to issue proposed values as MCLs. Overall, you can see the trend has been downward over time, mostly due to the emergence of toxicological information, different interpretations in the toxicological science, and different exposure assumptions used by different agencies in deriving their values. The derivation of these values is based upon a reverse risk assessment process, as I reviewed earlier, where risk-based concentrations are calculated using assumptions about toxicity and exposure. For example, this is the equation and assumptions that were used by EPA in deriving the Lifetime Health Advisory for PFOS in 2016. One term that's included in the development of these values is the Relative Source Contribution, or the RSC. This term is used to reduce the drinking water concentration so as to account for other possible PFOS exposures, including from our diet, from consumer products, from indoor dust, and from other sources. It's used to ensure that the total exposure of an individual does not exceed the acceptable dose. The reasons for the differences in the derived values by different agencies are summarized in this detailed chart. Basically, different agencies make different decisions or judgments regarding the toxicity of a chemical the drinking water consumption rate for an individual, and the relative source contribution. Taken together, this is why there is some variability in the values that are emerging from different agencies. This is discussed in more detail in the video training module on human and ecological effects. 
With regards to product regulations, from 2002 to 2013, under the Toxic Substances Control Act, EPA issued four significant new use rules covering 271 PFOS, including PFOA and PFOS. The significant new use rules place notification requirements on the manufacturing and importing of specific PFOS and allowed for continued low volume use of some compounds in certain circumstances. In 2017, PFOA and PFOS were listed as potential developmental toxicants under California's Proposition 65. The Prop 65 listing includes labeling requirements for manufacturers, distributors, and retailers, and restricts the discharge of PFOA and PFOS to sources of drinking water. The Food and Drug Administration currently regulates certain PFOS used as greaseproofing agents for food packaging, sometimes called food contact substances, and has banned three perfluoroalkyl ethyl compounds from use in food packaging. The FDA has also been conducting testing of foods for PFOS in areas with known environmental contamination, including limited surveys of dairy products, and is currently working with federal and state partners to test and evaluate potential uh, PFOS exposures via food. In 2018, Washington State passed House, House Bill 2658, which banned PFOS in food packaging. It takes effect in 2022. Several states and environmental agencies have established guidance values for standards for other environmental media, including groundwater, surface water, soil, biosolids, and biota. To help keep all this information straight and organized, ITRC has been maintaining a list of regulatory values on its website. The source has been updated monthly and provides references and notes that map out how and when updates have been made. The values have been changing rapidly as new information becomes available and as various agencies move to take action to help support risk managers. Here are some additional points worth noting regarding PFOS regulatory action in the United States. First, EPA drinking water health advisories are not enforceable standards, and PFOS are not yet identified as hazardous substances under the Comprehensive Environmental Response, Compensation, and Liability Act, also known as Superfund. To date, investigations and risk management actions at sites have largely been driven by other forces, including voluntary action due to pressure from public or regulatory agencies, including some that have issued enforceable groundwater standards, litigation, Clean Water uh, Act compliance, and other state regulatory action. Overall, while it can be challenging, it's critical to try to stay abreast of the state of PFAS science, policy, and regulation. And as, and as needed, consult with your local regulatory agencies, scientific community, environmental consultants, and legal counsel. I hope you found the information presented in this video informative and useful. The current state of our knowledge is such that we can make good use of risk assessment science to support PFAS risk management decisions in order to protect human health and the environment. However, as I've discussed, there are uncertainties and unanswered questions regarding PFAS fate and transport, exposure and toxicity, which can make performing a risk assessment where PFAS is involved a challenge. Finally, given the trend in regulatory action in the United States continues to be kinetic, while it can be difficult to keep up, it's important to try to do so. And we hope ITRC's PFAS video training, the PFAS technical regulatory guidance, the fact sheets can help make that challenge more manageable for you. On behalf of ITRC, thank you so much for joining us for this discussion of PFAS site risk assessment and regulatory action. As you can see, there are many details that should be considered when studying and using scientific information uh, regarding PFAS. Careful deliberation, along with the review of the most up-to-date knowledge base, should be incorporated in all PFAS project work. This family of compounds provides a large challenge for environmental professionals. And the best way to address this is with the most accurate information. It's the goal of ITRC to support this effort. Please follow us on social media and visit the ITRC PFOS webpage for additional information, videos, fact sheets, and guidance for PFOS and for other key environmental issues. Thank you.